everyone this is Ross in today's video we're gonna talk once again about my garden plans for 2019 um, we talked about in the prior video we talked about designing a garden um, this one I want to focus more on like what I'm gonna be growing um, try to get a little bit more ideas hash this out a little bit um, get some ideas from you guys I want to know right now from you guys what it is that you think I should grow because I have so much space to grow in now that I just feel like it's super important for me um, to grow all the things that I, I've been meaning to grow you know whether I didn't have enough room um, you know whether it was something that I just said you know what another time we'll experiment with that some other time what are the annuals or things that can fruit for me in one season I, they have to be pretty productive in one season for um, for it to be worth it to me um, because if it's not one season the garden kind of gets uh, tilled over and then we have to restart the whole process so it's got to be annuals um, you know there's a whole list of different perennial fruits that I'd like to grow at some point um, but for certainly there's definitely some vegetables that I'm just not I'm not thinking of and I've gone over different websites I've gone over Fedco I've gone over uh, Baker Creek I've gone over the seed savers I've gone over Johnny's I've gone over all these different seed companies to try to figure out if there is something that I'm missing and right now um, I think the one thing I really would like to to experiment with is runner beans or non bush type beans so like Borlotti beans um, is one different I guess type of a runner bean um, but any runner bean as an example that will climb up a trellis or up a fence um, these are some Borlotti beans here um, I would like to grow some beans to then have the beans um, stored for the winter time and that way I can um, you know soak them overnight and then cook them the next day um, I think there's a lot of value. I've had some really incredible beans and rice um, from local farmers in the area in Jersey, uh, up by actually the Brick Farm Market, if anyone knows where that is. They sell some pretty good local produce, and then there's also the Stockton Farmers Market in Stockton, New Jersey. Um, they have a whole bunch of local people there that really have an uh, incredible amount of um, quality produce that they produce and one of the things I've, I've tried there like I said was rice and beans and it's a whole nother level of rice and beans that I'm not I've never really been exposed to so I'd like to try to grow some of this if I can I've grown runner beans in the past the scarlet runner beans right here and they're beautiful um, they're incredible I would I would actually really like to use these because um, we're going to do a, a, a three sisters type planting here. So we have, this is the, the home garden here that I'm, that I've been growing in now for years. And this is sort of our, our two beds right here. We're really, we're really only limiting ourselves now, the two beds. And this is a big reason why, um, I wanted to expand my garden area. Um, you know, one of them is only 10 foot long and the other one's actually only 10 foot long. Um, I do have garlic and shallots and yacone in a separate section of it, but for the most part, uh, I really only have about, you know, about 120 square feet of growing. Um, and if I think about the amount of new space that I have, um, let's see, this is 10 by three. Okay, it's not even 120, it's actually half of that. I really only have about 60 square feet of growing space this year, but a 30 by 30 plot, which is what we're gonna be using um, at this community garden that we signed up for, that's 900 square feet of growing area, which is insane. This is more growing space that I've ever had by far. I think the most I ever had was probably 120. So, uh, you know, that's, that's just nuts. That's seven and a half times more space than I've ever had to grow vegetables. Um, so, you know, and it's going to be a successful growing space. I've had some, you know, you could even count 
maybe 120 square feet, but really less of, much less of that was actually sort of productive. Um, and not all this is going to be productive. You can see some missing space here, but that's because we're going to grow things that really like to sprawl out on the ground um, and take up a lot of space, like corn. This is one thing I've never successfully been able to do. Um, I got some of your guys' opinions in the last video. I appreciate that. Uh, I think we've sort of figured out the corn. I think we're going to really get it hashed out this year. Um, we'll do four rows of it in a square, um, three feet in between each row. And then in between the row, in the rows themselves, they're going to have a six inch spacing. Um, about four to eight inches, I think, is pretty good. Um, depending on how close you want to get. But um, for me, that sounds really reasonable. It should give me a lot of corn, probably more corn than I need. I mean, this whole thing is really giving me more than I need. And I think that was sort of my thought process on all of this, except for maybe a couple things like eggplant and some squash and maybe the fennel and the soybeans. These are These are probably the appropriate amount that I would need. Probably also the onions. You know, we also wanted to grow storage crops this year. Things that'll get us through most of the winter time. I'm not a big fan of squash in general. Um, there are some squash out there that I really like. And I may decide to do some squash down in these areas here. I haven't decided as to what melons, because um, the melons are gonna take priority, at least for me. They're so incredibly good. Um, they're gonna be easier to grow, I think, here just because I have them sprawled out along the ground some of these do need some special care and I went through my book um, you know that that amazing melon book the heirloom melons um, I forget the exact name of it by Amy Goldman we've talked about that in a prior episode of fruit talk and other videos uh, we went through that and we decided that we did a trial last year and what I've realized throughout doing that trial is that I was using 100% heirloom, um, non-hybrid, I should say, non-hybrid melon varieties, whether they're watermelons or cantaloupes or musk melon. Um, they were all not hybrids. And because of that, none of them were Fusarium wilt resistant. And I had thought maybe at least there could be some genetics within those that probably have some resistance. There's probably some of them maybe within that that's not bad and I thought maybe I'll just plant them all plant just the very tasty varieties and then see which ones out of that come through and perform well um, but I've realized that's just not the way to go instead I should have grafted them onto like a squash rootstock um, I think Dimitri uh, if I'm not mistaken was talking to me about that last year and I said you know what I'm not gonna do that but that was a big mistake. I, we should have definitely grafted them. Uh, we also have a big issue with the cucumber beetle at my at my place because we've been growing cucumbers for a while. And the cucumber beetle loves the cucumbers above everything else. But if the cucumbers are right next to the melons, it creates a whole other issue. There's other things we can do like we can plant some, um, and I think I'm gonna try to do this somewhere in here, is we can do things like nasturtium. Um, I think tansy was another one. And then also, um, what is the final crop? I think it's amaranth. Um, if it's not amaranth, it's it's some sort of mustard. I can't remember what exactly it is, but the amaranth I physically saw for myself is that they will deter the cucumber beetle away from the melons, away from the cucumbers. And the idea is the nasturtiums, I think, keep them away, or maybe the tansies keep them away as well. And then other things are more of a, a trap crop, like um, the amaranth, where the amaranth is what they go after and what they eat, and then they leave the other things alone. Now, I'm gonna be in a community garden, and, and one thing I've realized, especially with this place, is that there's gonna be a ton of weeds, there's gonna be a ton of people growing all kinds of crazy stuff, there's gonna be uh, probably not the best ecosystem of bugs in this community garden. Um, so, 
it's going to be far less superior. It's going to be very difficult to deal with all these different pests than what I'm normally used to dealing with. Because here in my yard, I have a really great ecosystem that I've sort of sort of helped along. At least I think I've sort of helped it along. But as time has gone on since I started, the ecosystem of bugs has completely turned around. I used to, in the beginning, I remember seeing every little bug imaginable every bug that i was just like blown away i was like what is that you know and it was it was probably so many different species hundreds of different species of bugs that i had seen um last year whereas like this this year uh, as a whole yeah you know i maybe only saw about a hundred different species of bugs at least that come to mind right you know, it was definitely a, a much more broader spectrum of all these weird insects. And they were in high frequency. And I imagine that's sort of what's going to happen. I'm going to probably have, you know, some struggles with my potatoes. Um, you know, with the beetles with the potatoes. There's um, even a bug that messes with alliums. I'm for, forgetting all the names of these different things. There's also that beetle that messes with squash. Um, I'm probably going to have a lot of the cabbage moths, I'm, I'm, even though a lot of this isn't really necessarily affected. Um, but I'm going to probably also have, well, I'm going to have some cabbage moths probably on the fennel. I'm probably going to have um, those big green, or is that actually maybe that is the cabbage caterpillar. No, that's not the cabbage moth. Um, those big green caterpillars that look crazy. Um, that eat on the nightshade family. So they're going to probably infect my, my tomatoes and my jalapeno and my peppers and my eggplants. And it's just going to be a giant mess. It's going to be a crazy ecosystem of bugs that I'm not used to. And I think that's going to be the biggest challenge of this. In addition to keeping down the weeds, I think in between all of this, where all this empty space is, um, a lot of this is going to get filled in eventually by the melons here. I mean, they're going to really sprawl sprawl out here and get to about probably 10 by 10, uh, maybe even 15 by 15, depending on, you know, how crazy I let them get or how, how well they're doing. Um, you know, I think melon, the, the watermelons also sprawl out a bit more than the, the musk melons and the cantaloupe. But as a general rule of thumb, um, you know, I, I'm going to put down as much material in these pathways, you know, in these garden pathways, these footpaths, anywhere where I'm not planting will have straw. Um, where the beets and the carrots, the turnips, the radishes are, um, I don't think the onions because I'm not sure I'm going to need it as much, but um, this is going to get put down some compost so I can direct seed into that. Also, they transplant well into that. Um, they grow well into that. You know, whereas things like onions and potatoes, um, you know, I can really just stack on the 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 mulch and the straw because they don't necessarily need that heat. Everything else in here, um, well, this stuff doesn't like the heat either. However. Um, I'm going to put down a layer of compost, which is going to cool down the soil a bit but not enough to the point where it's like straw, that's for sure. But definitely the things up here that need that heat, we're not gonna put down any mulch on top of that. We are gonna put down some compost and that's gonna help feed the soil obviously, but warm up the soil in those locations. We're gonna build a little bit of mounds for the melons, maybe a little bit of mounds for some of this stuff here, a mound for this, etc., etc. Maybe we'll even mound up the potatoes, but the point is, is that we're going to definitely cover this whole area to fight the weeds. And, you know, like I said, there's certain crops that want that mulch, which is good, like the potatoes and the onions. Um, but we really just need to pay attention to the weeds and the pests. And those are going to be, again, the two biggest things I run into. Um, I'm still not entirely sure what I want to do with my garden bed here. Um, I still can change this around. I can still change this around. It's not too late. Um, you know, so I'm sort of looking at this point for some ideas so that I can maybe fill this in or grow less of something or even go crazy with something. Um, I think the beans in terms of the runner beans and the borlotti beans that we talked about, 
those are going to be trellised up on the corn. And if that doesn't necessarily work, I could probably also do it around the exterior here. So this black line is a footpath all the way around um, where the fence is, where the, the netting is for the deer. So I could probably very easily grow runner beans up these, uh, these deer fencing, um, all kinds of different ways of getting those things in the garden. It's really not all that difficult. Um, you know, I think my most challenging crop is going to be the melons. Um, I think probably the easiest thing I'm going to grow is probably this stuff right here. Um, except for maybe the beets. I've struggled with beets in the past. Um, the soybeans are also very easy. And I'll probably have an easier time with the nightshade family as well. Um, I'm not going to be there as often as I'd like, as I mentioned in the other video. So I'm trying to make this as low maintenance as possible. And also this is keeping in mind having all the stuff at home, the stuff that I need on a more frequent basis, like the potatoes we harvest once, the onions we harvest once, we plant them once, we harvest them once. You know, these turnips, these radishes, I'm going to probably plant them all one day and harvest them all one day and then process them all another day. You know what I mean? Um, these patty pans, squash, the jalapenos, the peppers here. All the peppers will be harvested on one day of the year for the most part. Maybe maybe three or four times throughout the season. Um, you know, the swallow egg plants, the patty pans, you know, that's you can harvest them every time I go there. The orange banana tomatoes that I use for sauce, we harvest them maybe once a week. We bring them home, and that's our produce for the week. Um, you know, so I don't necessarily need to be here all the time. I'm not going to want to be here all the time. I think it's going to be fun and interesting and obviously great to observe how all this is working out um, because I've never had this much space before. We're definitely going to learn some new things. But um, like I said, so that's that's sort of all of our objectives. Everything I just mentioned was sort of just to give you guys a little bit of a background and to then think about, well, what it is that we're going to grow. Um, so still looking for ideas. I think we'll get to ideas in a minute. Let me just explain to you guys how this is all gonna work. Um, some things that we haven't explained. There's only gonna be two patty pan squashes here. I don't really eat a whole lot of zucchini or squash or foods like that. I'm not a big fan. Uh, they're not really my favorite vegetables and stir fries and different things like that. I think a patty pan squash would be nice because then you can, um, you can use them as like a stuffed pepper type thing and I think that's really brilliant because I'm not going to be growing peppers for the purpose of stuffing uh, like a big bell pepper you don't get many bell peppers here uh, we don't have enough heat we don't have enough season length um, so I'm growing peppers like Carmen and Jimmy Nardello that are very easy to grow um, that I can roast the Carmen I'm going to roast the Jimmy Nardello is going to be peppers that I preserve in vinegar and olive oil and different ingredients like that. That way I can have peppers all season long in the winter time, um, even probably next year. Um, these jalapenos here, the ghost pepper, the habanero, we're gonna make our own hot sauce. We're gonna preserve the jalapenos just like I preserve the peppers. Um, we're also gonna have our own salsa. I think we're gonna try our own salsa this year. I need some salsa rep recipes. I need to look into some hot sauce recipes. I wanna make some really legit hot sauce. I love really hot hot sauce. Habanero is actually a bit mild. Um, most of the habanero peppers that I've had in hot sauces, they're actually not that difficult for me to, to, uh, to deal with. Um, I actually really enjoy the ghost pepper level hot sauce. And then usually a bit hotter than that, I um, will have on occasion and I do also enjoy, but the ghost pepper is probably the the more, um, a bigger favorite of mine in terms of the the heatness level there. So we're gonna do the hot sauce, we'll do the, the salsa, the eggplants, we're gonna roast them every so often. So it's kind of like an every so often thing, the eggplants every so often, the patty pans every so often. Uh, this will be about six eggplants here, one every square foot. The same thing with the peppers, one every square foot. Um, so I'm gonna have a lot of pepper plants. This is like a lot of room. This is more peppers than I'm, I'm not. I'm not gonna know what to do with them all. Um, the orange banana tomato. There's gonna be um, a lot less of them because these are gonna be grown as a bush. I'm not gonna grow them vertically. 
Growing your tomatoes vertically is so, so awesome. I mean, uh, I'm gonna do it at home again. I don't wanna forget about them. This is a more superior way to do it. This is the um, definitely a better way of production in a smaller space, um, getting them to higher quality, to having less issues in general, just less headaches. Um, it's definitely a way better way of doing it here. Now, is it better everywhere? I don't know, but um, certainly these are the tomatoes here that I've designated as tomatoes that I will pick more frequently and eat more frequently. Whereas the orange banana is gonna be a tomato that I um, am not necessarily eating more frequently because we're just gonna harvest a bunch for sauce. Every week we'll harvest them, we'll make some sauce, we'll preserve them. We'll do a, like a probably, I'm probably gonna to have to do a day of preserving every week for different times of the season. Um, and then that way we just preserve as much as we can um, and save that stuff for the winter time. I need to also get more into canning and get more into preserving and get that whole technique down of, of, de of sanitizing the whole thing um, so that you know there's no issues of canning and then them going bad um, while they're in storage. Um, the soybeans, these are gonna be planted really like two to three, four inches apart. Uh, I plant them very close together. We put a seed in the ground. When the temperature is warm up to about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, we're good. Um, the orange, we make edamame out of these soybeans. The Chiba green variety is incredible. It's so incredibly productive, it's mind blowing. Um, so the Chiba green, a big favorite of mine for edamame. I make edamame probably once a week. Great snack. One of the easiest things to grow and then to process and then to eat. It's like a stupidly, incredibly tasty snack that um, it would just be it would be crazy not to grow. The orange banana tomato, we will space them because they're going to be grown as a bush. I'll probably have some steaks on the end here, and maybe I'll have some string and different things in there. I'm not entirely sure how exactly I want to grow them as a bush just yet, but um, we will let we'll probably space them every two to three feet. I'm not gonna really go crazy with the spacing here because they are gonna produce a lot. I mean, so a lot of it's gonna have an issue, but the orange banana tomato is a, a wonderful, wonderful producer here in this climate. The fennel, uh, fennel you can do about every six inches, um, even eight inches. You can also do fennel in clumps, multi-sow your fennel as Charles Dowding does on. Um, with his fennel, I believe he does as well. Um, on the left here, again, we're gonna have onions. These are gonna be different types of onions. We're gonna have, like one is the Walla Walla. Also another one I thought of is the Tropia Red Onion, onion that my buddy Joe highly recommends. Um, those have to be eaten pretty soon after you harvest. Uh, but we are gonna do many storage onions. That's really the big goal here, is to have onions for storage We'll store them all underneath the sunroom. Same thing with the potatoes, is that we're doing um, Yukon Gold exclusively. Again, we're gonna space them. We're gonna have three rows, eight inches between the rows, um, eight inches between every plant in, in actuality. It's gonna be a tight squeeze. I don't necessarily have to squeeze them this close. I could do 12 inches. I've done 12 inches very successfully. I heard somebody tell me, or maybe it was 10 inches, but eight to 10 inches, is maybe I'll just settle on 10 and call it a day. But if I do eight inches here, um, I can fit three rows in two feet. Because if you divide 24 inches by eight inches, you get three rows. Um, it's a lot of food. That's a lot of potatoes. Um, again, all for storage. The Turnips, radishes, beets, carrots, you can do multiple rows of these. Um, this is for you know for a one foot wide bed, you could probably do three rows of them spaced four inches apart in each of these little beds here, um, which is gonna be very productive. You can pretty much just scatter the seeds anywhere. They do really well even growing very close together. Uh, it's, it's nuts. These are mainly gonna be grown though for processing into like pickled radish, pickled turnips, pickled beets. Uh, beet juice is another one and then also carrots. Carrots mostly to eat myself. Um, 
but we can also shred them up and we can make like things like kimchi we can make different fermented products not just pickled things um, because most of what I've mentioned already is pickled but we can definitely ferment a lot of this stuff um, all right so that that kind of brings us over down here into this section and corn we've talked about the want the desire to grow corn the unsuccessfulness that I've had in the past it's been a mess um, I think in general just having it in a square having the right spacing having um, the right variety we're gonna do silver queen so that's one thing I should mention as well silver queen corn um, it's a standard variety it's not the super sweets it's not the sugar enhanced it's not the whatever the other two genetic varieties are I can't remember the names this is just a standard variety it's an old heirloom I've been told by experienced growers that these standard varieties usually are more drought tolerant I'm not gonna be watering anything we're gonna mulch very well. We're gonna put down enough compost. And, you know, we have plenty of rain. The soil is very heavy clay. So we are not going to have to water this. If I get to this community garden very early in the season, sometime in April, the soil is gonna be very saturated. If I go out there right now, it's saturated. What I need to do is put down mulch immediately. Put down that mulch, put down that compost immediately. It's the first thing I do. If I do that, it's gonna conserve all that moisture and it's going to also keep in all that moisture that then continues to rain throughout the season. There will be plenty of rain all season long, unless we have some sort of weird drought, which I seriously doubt we're going to have a drought. Um, if we do have a drought, maybe I would consider watering. But for the most part, I really don't think I'm going to have to, guys. Um, and I know that's crazy to think about, but I haven't watered my garden beds for the last four to five years here. Um, it's just not necessary. Um, however, I have a lot more material down on those garden beds um, as in the form of compost. So uh, there might be the difference there, the difference maker. Plus the soil is not exactly the same as it is in my house, but it's still that very heavy clay. It still is the same material that I'm used to. Um, it may not be as nutritious, it may be infected with more pests or have more pests within it um, but you know what it's uh, it should work the same it should work the same way it's the community gardens only about 10 15 minutes from my house um, it's only I think about three if I had to guess three to four miles away um, so it's not really the biggest difference in location um, the other big difference I could think of is that it is in full sun all day for the most part at least it should be in full sun all day I have to go back and really examine that to be sure but um, my gardens are not so that would be a slight difference there um, and we may just have more transpiration more evaporation I should say that way um, but you know just in general we're not gonna have to really worry about that we're not gonna feed we're not gonna water this is gonna be a carefree no frills garden just trying to get everything in here low maintenance and get as much out of it as I can um, so that's what the, that's the idea that's the idea with the corn and I know a lot of people recommend have their heavy feeders we should feed them we should water them I'm not of that opinion um, at least I'm not a commercial grower and I'm not doing this professionally so to me it doesn't matter um, I'm not gonna spray anything I'm not gonna do one little thing for pests probably I would like to net some things if I could uh, with some mesh um, but I reading the rules I need to be a bit more clear on this but unfortunately reading through those some of these rules is that it's not Unfortunately, it's it's uh, it's it's not allowed to use materials that are not biodegradable in the garden plot. Um, you can use a deer fencing, I think, and that is like it, and that's all you got. Um, I can't even use metal stakes. 
Um, I can't use PVC. I can't use, um, seems like most netting. Uh, I don't know about the netting thing. Definitely some mesh or like polyester type materials that you could put over your rows. I don't think I can use some of this stuff. And that to me really creates some issues with some crops. Specifically our nightshades if we get hit with too many caterpillars. Um, particularly our melons here. If we have the cucumber beetle in crazy amounts. Um, also the potatoes potentially. We may want to cover those. The onions we may even want to cover. Um, and most of the stuff I'm not going to be growing like all season. You know, some of the stuff's going to come out of here like this. This will mostly be out of the garden by July. So that's when this stuff here really is starting to take over anyway. And then this can kind of do its thing. Um, and I'll just, this won't be here, you know. Uh, the tomatoes will be here. The soybeans will be here. I think that's a really good point and thought that I should consider is that this is not going to be here. All of this will be here. All of this will be here um, up until frost. So it's. I think maybe I could even go more this way with the garden um, in preparation for this coming out. I probably have more space than I had imagined, uh, which is good in a way. I mean, that I would really like to grow some squash potentially. There's the kabocha squash that I really am fond of. The spaghetti squash, butternut squash, and the delicata squash were some that we really um, had our, our aims towards last year. I did grow some butternuts this year. Um, I haven't had kabocha squash in a while. Spaghetti squash, I'm not really on the, I'm on sort of on the fence about. Because it's hard to replace pasta, guys. It just is. Um, so, I don't know. We may consider some squash. We're going to do some beans. Let me know what you guys think about a specific melon, a specific squash, a specific... Um, you know, maybe we'll do pumpkin. That's one that I, in the past, have done and just decided not to do um, anymore. Um, I probably could put another melon, let's say right here, um, unless it encroaches this area here. Um, hmm. So let me know what you guys think about this and I'm trying to look for some ideas now. The cucumbers we're gonna do at my house and this is the only reason I'm thinking about doing cucumbers at my house even though we have the cucumber beetle here and they almost always have Fusarium wilt in the in the beetle. Um, is that the only reason I'm thinking about it is because I can net them. I can put the mesh over it, keep the beetles out completely, and I'll have actually a pretty decent, successful crop of cucumbers. Um, but I can't grow them vertically like I have in the past. You have to mesh them. Um, things in this garden, as I've said, are the brassicas for the most part. And things that I harvest very frequently. So things like herbs um, that I can just, if I'm you know, cooking dinner, I need an herb, go outside, get the herb, go back in. Um, these are tomatoes I pick more frequently and eat fresh. The Brussels sprouts, the Happy Rich, and all these different brassicas, as we mentioned in the prior video. The reason I'm growing them here is because they are a very early spring crop and a late, like almost winter crop. So I have to, no choice, but grow them and start them earlier than what this garden plot allows. This garden plot will probably start sometime in like mid-April, maybe even the 1st of April if I'm lucky. The 1st of April would actually be a pretty good date um, for some of these brassicas, but ideally I'm getting these brassicas in a head start indoors, planting them all out by uh, March 15th. We're covering them with mesh to give them some extra heat, protect them from the frost, protect them from the wind. Um, if I do that, you can have a successful brassica crop here and get most of your harvest in June and by mid-July. <clears throat> then you do that whole process over again. And sometime in July and even maybe August, 
August, you're kind of pushing it, but uh, you then plant more brassicas to get a, a winter crop sometime in like November and December, um, and even January if you have yourself a cold frame. Um, even some things like right now, we're almost at the end of January. We are at the end of January. Um, would have survived the season thus far. Um, in fact, I had definitely overwintered um, Brussels sprouts at my house. All winter, they got through that no issue. I was able to have Brussels sprouts. Um, they didn't grow necessarily, but I was able to harvest some Brussels sprouts at weird times of the year. So because this garden then also ends in October, sometime in like October, um, around frost, is that I'm not really gonna be able to grow brassicas here late in the season anyway. So I figure because the brassicas need more attention, they're definitely a, a difficult crop to grow. Definitely the most difficult crop out of any of these crops, I think, is the highest learning curve uh, is the, the brassicas and the lettuces and things like that. This is stuff I feel like, like the corn has a nice learning curve, but more importantly with the melons and the squash and the corn, they just need a lot of space. So that was kind of my rationale. And that's why, again, we have things like arugula, mizuna, uh, we have our sugar snap peas, we have our broccoli, our bok choy, all the brassicas, the Brussels sprouts, the happy rich, all the stuff that I can grow here give it the care and attention that it needs and plus I can use the mesh if I can use the mesh at the community garden that may change things around for me but it is what it is same thing with the cucumber it needs more attention needs that mesh I mean honestly a lot of this stuff needs mesh a lot of it um, you know I very reluctant to even grow melons without mesh but I specifically now have chosen and I didn't get into this but Watermelon in general seems to be less susceptible to this cucumber beetle, to also to the wilt. Um, they don't seem to, need to be nearly as bothered, it's, it seems like. But also these new melon varieties here that I've chosen, uh, Savor and Sarah's Choice, these are Fusarium wilt resistant to zero to two. They're also powdery, powdery milder resistant. Savor is a Charente type which is a very uh, incredible type of melon that is grown in France. One of the best tasting melons in the entire world. Um, and I've always wanted to try one of these types, but this Savoir here seems to be one of the better um, melons that's very resistant to all these different things. It's highly resistant um, to powdery mildew and Fusarium wilt, and it should ripen here in time. So. Um, that seems to be like a really good choice even though it is a hybrid it's a bit more expensive it maybe isn't as well adapted here um i think it's really my best choice um unless i'm going to be grafting um some of these varieties and i uh i would like to do some grafting and learn how to do that but it just seems to be at this point to be a little bit too much for me at this point um it's really all that not that difficult. I've seen it done. You know, you just make a cut with your knife. I'm not entirely sure on the timing of the whole thing, but you just get yourself a clip, put the two pieces together, clip it, and you're done. And then that's it. But um, for me, I'm not really too interested in that just yet. Um, one day, one day. But let me know what you guys think. I've also thought about growing the Solanum berries. So there's some Solanum berries that um, Baker Creek, as an example, um, you know, kind of talks about and has all these different types. So there's like the Wonderberry, the Garden Huckleberry, the Litchi Tomato. There's also the Ground Cherry. Um, there's all these different Solanums that are related to tomatoes quite similar um, related to like the ground cherry and they put out these weird berries and you, you have to process them in some way. I figured maybe this is the year that I grow myself some ground cherries because I have so much space and what I would like to do with the ground cherry is actually um, process them into jam. I hear they make some great jam. Um, I'd have to rearrange this if I was going to get probably 
maybe another row in here somewhere or something like that but um, yeah that would be sort of the goal if anyone has any sort of thoughts on what it is that you guys think I should grow I mean I was just even going through like some of these vegetables here and none of them really seem all that interesting to me you know that really fits my needs like leeks kohlrabi I think I'd like to try at some point both of these but you know they're more of a cool loving crop it would really need to be something that loves the heat you know something that really does well in the heat in the middle of our summer and um, would be worth growing like maybe I'll try artichokes again see if I can get an artichoke that will fruit for me in one season uh, which is hard to find I did grow the green uh, green globe here and that one did flat or did actually put out a head of artichoke but it was only one and it was one out of four plants that did that so um, I don't really think most of these will put out a lot of heads for me uh, they're probably gonna be pretty small some people have suggested cardoon um, never tried it but I don't really have too much interest in that for some reason um, I know a lot of people have suggested different types of beans in the past um, there was some things that I was pretty interested in last year and I just found found them to be not all that great like some of the Asian greens things like the horizontal I didn't really think was all that spectacular um, hmm. There's not a whole lot of herbs that really interest me. Cabbage I find to be just quite difficult here. Um, it takes up a lot of space. You know, it's either cauliflower or broccoli with the limited space I have growing um, some of that other stuff. You know, here's kind of where you can find all these berries, all these solanum berry weird things in here. Um, you know, what else am I looking at? You know, they just have strange things. Okra, pff, I mean, I like eating okra, but not enough to really be like, oh, let's harvest some okra and let's cook with it, you know? I thought peanuts would be interesting. Grow my own peanuts. Maybe there's some sort of bean, like maybe chickpeas or something that would be worth it. I don't know. Um... Yeah, let me know what you guys think. What are some things that you think that I should grow? And you're like, gotta grow it, Ross. Um, you know, just there's definitely already some things in here that I'm gonna grow and some things that are not even listed here, like um, kale and Swiss chard. We're kind of just gonna scatter them throughout the yard because they just do so well. I don't have to have a specific spot for them. Um, you know, also the, the alpine strawberry here is a big, I'm a big fan of that guy now and we did propagate quite a bit I have a number of these plants I could even propagate more if I wanted um, they're a bit difficult to get established from seed but um, it's possible I did it um, the issue though with the alpine strawberry is that I would like to have like a select bed for them and I figure even a raised bed like this would be perfect, but it's just one of those things that am I really willing to give up this space to plant alpine strawberries? I would like to have though in the future for sure a bed of alpine, just alpine strawberries. Um, I just don't know where that would be in the yard at this point. You know, it's one of them things that I sort of realized a little bit too late in the game that it's so, so good and I should have made some sort of room for them um, in the past. Um, what else? That's that's kind of it, guys, in terms of the, the plans, what it is I think I'm going to do. Again, love to hear everybody's opinion and love to hear what you guys think I should do. You know, I've just been basically going through all this stuff and saying, all right, well, what do I want to do? You know, <laughs> rutabagas... I mean, there's some things I just don't really find to be all that interesting, you know. Um, here's that garden huckleberry I was talking about. 
you know, I think there is a lot of our, I'm already growing quite a bit, you know what I mean? So it's like, if I find one more thing that I want to grow, I think that would make me happy. Um, there's probably some flowers and different things that maybe I should think about. The nasturtium for sure, I think is a great idea. Um, especially if it really does repel the cucumber beetle. So that's sort of it for this video guys i hope you guys got something out of this um maybe it inspired you to grow something maybe it inspired you guys to join a community garden i don't know but i want to thank everybody out there who was watching um stuck through this video got to the end thank you guys we'll talk to everybody soon check out our our blog figboss.com and check us out on facebook instagram and um we'll see you guys soon all right everybody uh take care and uh yeah let me know down below what you guys think. All right, take care.